Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome back to Modern Leadership. Let's start today by taking a poll. How many of you are currently in your dream job? All right, next question. Whether you are currently in your dream job or not, how long do you think you will work for your current employer? You know, in the past, we've talked a lot about the shrinking average tenure in positions for millennials, Gen Xers, boomers, and that continues today. But what I want to talk about, what I want to jump into today specifically is how technology, more educated workforce, reduced job training, how all of these things have resulted in employers needing less time to make a return on their human human investments. And that's dramatically changed what it means to have a career. Specifically, employees who don't adapt to this new reality will find themselves competing with coworkers for recognition, bouncing from job to job, and perpetually feeling like the low man on the totem pole. And to have this conversation, I have invited Heather MacArthur to join me today. Heather has over 20 years experience in helping employees blaze fulfilling career paths in an ever-changing work landscape. From serving in the military to carving out her role as a coach and consultant to Fortune 500 companies, Heather has built her expertise from hard-fought personal career choices. She is the author of the new book, Low Man on the Totem Pole, Stop Begging for a Promotion, Start Selling Your Genius, and today she is our guest expert. Heather, it's so good to have you with us. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Well, this is exciting. This is a topic that we talk about a lot on the show because a lot of our listeners are going through that career transition stage in life, whether they're climbing the career ladder and changing positions within their company or jumping ladders to work for different companies, or even some that are leaving traditional employment to go out and be more entrepreneurial. And so I find this topic fascinating. But before we jump into that, let's get to know you just a little bit. So tell Tell us about Heather. Uh, well, you know, you, you, you mentioned a few things in terms of what my career path is, but I, I you know, spent some time in the military. I worked in, in retail and, and fast food jobs before that as, as a teenager. But when I got out of the military, there's this moment of, um, you know, even with their transition services, not knowing how to package what it was that I did into something that I could make a living from. And, you know, through a lot of the trial and error of figuring out how to package the resume, how to market myself, how to go on interviews how to use my transferable skills. Uh, it gave me some kind of street knowledge on how to make this work for people. And I just kept thinking, you know, someone who's trying to get gainful employment shouldn't have to spend a lot of money to get a resume written or spend a lot of money to, to get guidance as to how to move forward. Uh, instead, it should be something where the, the information is available. So that I've been probably thinking about this book for, uh, you know, a good two decades through my career. And then I just had the luck of being able to work with a lot of different people at different stages in their career, at different levels in, in companies, in several different industries. And, um, and that's kind of how I boiled down these best practices into one, one book. Yeah. And, you know, as you talk about that, the idea that comes to my mind is we're leading into a culture or as, you know, as employment culture as a nation where people are becoming more and more specialized. And I know this happened to me. You know, I started out college. I went and got a JD and an MBA, which in my opinion would make me marketable to a whole lot of people. But then I took my first job and I got really skilled in one area. And then as I was looking to change jobs, change careers, change companies, one of the challenges that I had is that my occupational background, my professional experience was very specialized. And do you see this as kind of happening a lot in our culture? Yeah, well, I think it's just kind of understanding uh, business 101, like having an MBA and even having a law background, I think it sets you up to be savvy in business, but you have to know what business you're in. And I think when you're starting off early in your, in, in your career, it, it is about trying things on and seeing what fits. I like to, I like to relate a little bit to dating, like it's healthy to date. It's, it's healthy to go try out things and see what's the fit, but it's also fair for the customer on the pain end to go, I don't know how much I want to gamble on a person in this role. And there's certain roles they're willing to gamble on. There's other roles that the, the risk is a little bit higher. They want someone who's got more experience. They want someone who's been doing it for a while. So I think it's, you've got to be kind of, you know, clear with yourself as to where am I at and figuring out what business I'm in and what services go with that. And everyone specializes in something, 
but how broad your specialty is and how many services come with that, you get to decide. It just may not happen overnight for people. And do you find that a lot of people, particularly as they get mid-career or maybe early mid-career, so they've been in the, the job market now for 10, 12 years, you know, they've started in on a career path, but all of a sudden they're starting to discover who they are, what their passion is. We hear a lot of podcasters talking about find your purpose, find your calling, find your passion. And maybe some of our listeners have heard that you know, on this podcast, even we've talked a lot about that and they're looking at it and they're saying, you know, I've just spent the last 10 or 12 years working in one particular field. And all of a sudden I start thinking about my passion and purpose in a different field. Am I basically stuck or where do we go from there? If we're already late, early career or mid early career? I don't, I mean, I don't think anybody's stuck, but I, I, you know, you, that's the beauty of being in a, in the, in the society that we're in. Does that mean that it's easy? Does that mean that it's low risk? no, um, but I find what I, when I'm talking to people and they're talking about wanting to change their career, what I first want to understand is not just their purpose of their job, but what are they, what are they up to in life? Cause that'll tell me a lot when it, when they say, this is what I'm up to in life. Then we have discussions around what is the right amount of risk and is the career, the area that you want to take it. If they're in a situation where they've built, you know, 10, 15 years and invested it in a career that they're not really thrilled with now, a lot of times what I hear is they put family as a priority versus career, or they put, you know, kind of supporting, um, just paying the bills above, you know, career risk, or they did what they could, you know, they knew they could be successful at versus risking something that they loved, but not sure how that might turn out. Um, so that all tells me, okay, there's some other priority that you've got, some other purpose that you're living, you know, is this the right time to take that risk? And then we discuss what is the amount of risk that they can live with, that they feel comfortable with. It's not going to make them lose their mind. And, um, and, and what's the right timing for them to make those changes? But they might also have to take a job that's not at the same level. I think people get caught up in it's got to keep kind of trucking forward. But business is not school. It's not, you know, at school, you don't want to take, you're in 11th grade and now you're going to go back to 6th grade for a while. Um, but business is not like that. So if you have a position where maybe you're an EVP somewhere and then you go somewhere else and you're a frontline manager or you even just start off as a novice somewhere, you're going to still have that EVP experience and you can merge them later. Um, but you've got to, you've got to be able to, 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 to take the gamble uh, that learning that skill and, and moving to the left or taking a few steps back that you'll bring back all that leadership experience you have or all that business experience that you got. Like none of that goes to waste. And I think people don't always realize that. And they end up just kind of doing, I always say, I'd rather be on a roller coaster that maybe is a little scary, but exciting um, and different than on the same stretch of highway that's always going to be the same. And I'm always going to know that it's disappointing. Well, it's interesting that you say that because historically, when we looked at careers and, you know, our occupations, it was more of that straight line. It was more of, you know, come in at the bottom and take those incremental steps up, work with the same company for your whole career. And now it's shifting to be more of an opportunity for us to be on that roller coaster ride, which sometimes is going to spin us for a loop. But because we have this history, this habit or mental processing that is straight line, I think sometimes getting on the roller coaster scares us. And when I say scares us, one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, if I'm an executive vice president or an EVP with a company, I've got reputation. Part of my compensation is my reputation. It's, it's the position that I hold. Now, if I take a position somewhere else, yes, I take that experience with me, but two things that I don't necessarily take with me is the compensation financially and the compensation reputationally. And I think sometimes that causes us to take pause in opportunities that are in front of us, not because they're not good opportunities, but because culturally taking that what we would perceive as going from 11th grade to 6th grade is not something that we're willing or even able to do, particularly if we have family or kids to support. Well, and, and, and absolutely. And I think sometimes when there's kids and family uh, in the mix, and that's where I'm really you know thoughtful about the, the risk factor of what really feels comfortable for them, what's suited for their for their lifestyle, what are they willing to tolerate? But the reality is, is uh, as Western culture, we've got really only about a century of us being used to this kind of uh, climb the ladder kind of structure. It started with the factory systems, and it was this idea of as we got into this manufacturing kind of thought process of mass production, companies needed people to hang out for a long time and do the same thing over and over again to perfection. So it made sense that they built these kind of career ladders to keep people around for a long period of time. 
Technology changes the need for how much we need people to stay with their level of knowledge. The rapid pace of change, this idea that having all the same people sometimes isn't the best thing for companies. So that landscape is changing. As much as we want to say, oh, millennials change their jobs so frequently, businesses actually are changing employment status so frequently with reorgs and shifting priorities and mergers. So it's it's really just the shape of where business is going. Um, I, I think that if, if you're trying to assess of like, oh, should I do this or not? You're absolutely right. We've been groomed to be kind of risk averse to this idea of leaving something that's working and maybe I'll lose some money. Um, this is part of the reason why we've got to get better at thinking big picture, long term. Am I doing this just because I'm interested or because I've got this long term game plan that I'm investing in and I'm willing to take the risk for? But that's what capitalism is. That's what that supply and demand is. So that entrepreneurial spirit is actually what it was all founded on. And what's fascinating is when I talk to people who have recently immigrated from other countries, you know, you've got people who are doctors, professors, and all that who came to another country for different reasons. And, uh, and now they'd be doing a completely different job uh, until they figure out how to either continue doing what they did in the previous country or build a completely new life, but they are less risk averse as some of the Western culture that I've come across simply because we've been groomed for a long time that stability is the right way. Yeah, and I think we've seen this, you know, as we t- study immigrants that come into the country that tend to have a higher, not not necessarily risk tolerance, but the ability to really see opportunities and go after it. And part of that is what you talked about. It's they're being forced into a situation where they have to take their skills, their education, their knowledge from what they had before and apply it to a different opportunity. And it gives them the ability to think outside the box. It, it, it gives them the ability to approach a problem from a different angle than, you know, those who, those of us who have gone through the traditional route of schooling and education and then, you know, climb the corporate ladder. So one of the things you talk about, Heather, is this need to stop climbing the corporate ladder and start building what you call a web. So talk to us a little bit about this. Yeah, so that actually feeds into it. It's not just whether or not you feel stable. The reality is, is businesses more and more are looking for, especially people who are in executive positions, that they have a well-rounded, holistic understanding of an organization. So traditionally, it would be somebody who climbed the ladder. Let's just take accounting, for example, finance. The CFO is somebody who was in the company for a long time, started off as a clerk, and now all of a sudden he's, you know, he or she has like worked all these years and have been promoted vertically and now they're the CFO. What organizations are getting is that they actually look at, well, was, were they the CFO of different areas? Did they maybe be a, a manager on the front end versus just the support end? And what, you know, how do they understand really how the business operates? And that's for every function out there. So when people are so hesitant to take a step back, uh, what I'd say is it actually is now starting to hurt your chances at moving up to a certain level because I've sat in those interviews and as an HR person or on a, on a hiring panel, and I've heard them discuss, you know what, they've only been in one area. They've been very siloed. And yes, they got promoted very quickly, but that might even be a red flag. Did they get promoted too early? Is their experience well-rounded enough? So if the goal is I want to get to the highest rung of the ladder as possible, then by all means, definitely develop the web. But for anybody, the more holistic exposure you get to the different sides of business and how it operates and the different kind of struggles that it has, the better you'll be at your job. And so to, to kind of see lateral moves and sometimes some step backs, as if, it's, if it all p- fits in the bigger picture for you, that it'll actually strengthen your ability to command um, you know, your credibility as well as negotiate for pay because of the wealth of experience that you have. And if you take these opportunities that are maybe you know, less pay initially, but you bring your sk- experience and your expertise, your rounded abilities to that position, your ability to grow and move up in that position will be a lot quicker. Now, one of the things we talk about on this uh, show a lot is ladder hacking. And Heather, have you heard of the book Smart Cuts by Shane Snow? I haven't, no. Yeah, so... It was one of my favorite books, but the the subtext of it is how hackers, innovators, and icons shortcut success. And he calls them smart cuts because they're shortcuts with integrity. But one of the things he talks about is this new trend that's happening in the business world, and that is those who reach the top of the ladder aren't leaning their ladder up against a building and climbing to the top, but they put their ladder up against a building, climb a couple of rungs, and then 
jump ladders, move to another building and start climbing that. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about how it impacts our ability to grow as we, as we jump back and forth. So an example would be I'm, when I was in banking earlier, the, the uh, recommendation in order to rise in the banking world was to keep jumping banks because every time you made a switch, you would get a promotion as opposed to trying to climb the ladder from within. And so you being in this world, what do you think about this ladder hacking and switching ladders? Well, I like what you said about, you know, doing it with integrity. Um, I, I will say that through my career, I did a lot of that ladder jumping, but I did it because I saw that the capacity to learn and develop my skills was, was very quickly kind of dried out in the different positions, especially in my early years in my career. And that's before it was acceptable. This is when it was kind of frowned upon to do that. So all my friends were like, don't do it, Heather. It's going to hurt your, your ability to get a job at some point. But I just, I just saw it as I can't possibly stay here and expect to develop and grow. I've kind of run, run out the, the runway on it. Um, so, but any time that I jumped a ladder, I didn't leap and leave that ladder to fall. Um, because I was leaving, for the reasons I was leaving, I always gave a lot of leeway in terms of time and notice and made sure that I set up the next person for success. So if you're jumping ladders, you can't just leave a weight behind. And I think what sometimes people don't get, because it's relatively new that it's okay uh, to do or that it's even seen as acceptable, and you, mainly because more and more companies have done all these layoffs, it's less that they can stand by, you should be here and collect the gold watch. They're not promising that stability. They can't expect their staff to stay forever either. But you have, to, you have to see yourself as a business owner, and if you're leaving your client, you can't leave them in the lurch. So by all means, make those leaps, but leave a nice, clean reputation because what you may not realize when people say, like, oh, the tenure is much shorter, it actually will be quite long. Um, the companies that I've worked for, I've worked for them in so many different capacities, whether that's as a consultant, internally, leaving and coming back later. And a part of the reason I could even do that is every time I left, I made sure I didn't leave a mess behind. I gave them the, 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 the time and the notice and the setup so that that was something that, that didn't leave them, you know, feeling just screwed up because of the way that I left them. Um, I think that's something that people are missing. They're kind of seeing it as, um, oh, we can kind of just go and come and do whatever we want to do and not recognize that, no, those relationships are going to last a long time and your reputation will last a long time. So make those leaps, do it strategically, but assume that those people are going to be working with you 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And I think what you're saying is so vitally important. I want to make sure the listeners are paying attention to this. And I had a conversation just earlier today with one of my coaching clients, and we talked about boomerang employees. Now, she's an employer, and we were talking about bringing on some people onto her team, and we talked about this boomerang employee, and that is you know, employees that you may send out into the world to work for other companies and other things, but come back to you in the, in the form of referrals or even come back to you and work for you. And I think that's what I hear you saying is one thing that you strategically always did when you left a position was you never burned a bridge. You created an opportunity that if that boomerang needed to swing back to that company, being you, that you would always be welcomed back into open arms because you created an environment that was respectful. It was an environment that they knew what they were getting. The work that they were getting done from you was worthwhile and they would be happy to have you back. The other thing that you talked about, and I want to dive into this a little bit more, and that is companies understand that they're not offering us job security. And so they're not expecting uh, that we would be with them, that we would basically uh, connect, connect ourselves to them for our whole careers. Do you see, though, that there's a lot of companies out there that while they won't offer us the same job security indefinitely that but they're asking for us to be more loyal to them than they are to us? Uh, yeah, 100%. I think it's just this, we're in this weird transition time where not everyone's gotten the memo. Um, and, um, and also companies who haven't quite figured out how to quickly onboard people as well as, um, you know, managers who are really strong people managers. So if you've got a lot of strong people managers, they know how to take new hires, get them up to speed very quickly, develop them, move them forward. If I'm not a really strong people manager, then when you take my talent, I'm very stressed because I don't know if I'll get lucky enough to get already developed talent again. Um, so there's, there's companies who haven't quite got the memo, especially if they haven't done a major layoff. Now, I was there on the receiving end of two layoffs pretty quickly around 2001, which is what opened me up to this concept of, 
you know, I remember even the HR person person calling me into the office. This is back in, gosh, you know, late 90s and, and reprimanding me for having my resume out on Monster at the time. And I, I said with her, I was like, I'm not under contract. You're not guaranteeing me a job. How is it bad if I kind of keep my eye on what's going on in the market in case I need another job? You know, a year later, I'm getting laid off and so is she. I have a job in two weeks. She doesn't. And, you know, and I think, I think it was an interesting eye opening for me to go, no, you know, the, we're not under contract. This, people have to be healthy about it. Now, I've had discussions with managers who didn't agree with that and managers who did. And at the end of the day, I had to, you know, I had to make the decisions that were best for, for my career. And don't be wrong, I have left jobs. And even though I tried to make sure that I didn't leave anybody in the lurch, that doesn't mean everybody was happy when I, when I made the decision that I made or was thrilled with the fact that I was choosing something else and went before they were ready to see me go. Um, and so, you know, I can't guarantee that everyone's going to be at peace with the decisions that I'm making, but I try to make sure that I do no intentional harm and that I go above and beyond to try to offer, you know, when I hear people go like, well, two weeks is all I have to offer. And I go, you know, no, I've, I've told jobs before, hey, I want to be able to offer a month or three weeks. Can we do this transition in a different way so that I don't have to leave this, this other job in a lurch? It'll benefit you. I'll make sure you have that kind of leeway with me as well. And I've always found that that's been something that I've been able to negotiate or work with. And I, I think it just it sets people up to feel safer working with you. I've also been very honest and upfront with a lot of my jobs where I share that I'm more of a sprinter than a long distance runner. And, and I'm not a millennial. I, I, I would be considered Gen X, but I just, and I was definitely an odd bird out of all my friends. Uh, but I very quickly noticed that at about a year or two, I would burn out on a job. And it's part of the reason why consulting ended up being a really good career for me. But in the meantime, I started to share with people, like, look, my track record is I, I, I probably have about a year or two of a run on things. I, I tend to sprint. And if there's a lot of different projects and a lot of different new things, you'll keep me around for longer. I've stayed at jobs for four years or so. This now consulting I've been doing six years because there's so much different stuff going on. But I try to be upfront about that. It's a risk. I guarantee you there's jobs that I didn't get because of that. But I got to a place where I realized if I'm not upfront about that, I'm actually risking hurting my credibility and people kind of thinking I'm not delivering on goods promised if I'm not clear. And the more I'm able to kind of share what my brand is and the type of services that I provide and what that ends up looking like, the more they can make an informed decision of whether or not I'm the right person to hire. And if they are going to hire me, how to get the most bang for the buck while I'm there. And this is going to sound crazy to a lot of the listeners, Heather, but my last job that I left, I gave a four-month notice. I wanted to have the opportunity to help them identify my replacement and get them trained and in the position in time to hit the ground running. And it created a lot of goodwill. So I wanted to ask a couple of these additional questions from the book. One of them, and you brought it up just briefly, and that is, quickly onboarding people. Now, this is a new trend. This is a new opportunity for us as employers. Can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of quickly being able to onboard new hires? Yeah, I mean, because um, people are transitioning in and out of roles. So when I hear HR and leadership going, how do we increase retention? I think whether they realize it or not, the conversation is starting to shift to not how do we increase retention, meaning how long an employee stays, but how do we increase engagement while they're here? so that you immediately can get the most out of them the minute you hire them versus three or four months them getting acclimated to the environment. Um, Being intentional about how they onboard has a lot to do with that. The quicker they can get, you know, um, meet with people, get a pulse on what the culture is, understand, you know, clear who's to call, when to call, and then kind of throw them in the pool a little bit faster, but also have managers who are professional people managers. And that's something that has been lost in the wake of things where more and more people are, have been promoted because they're good at the job that they do. So because of that traditional, because you're good, we're going to reward you with a promotion and now you're in charge of others. I, and like, that's like saying, because I speak to a lot of people, I should be an English teacher. It's a very different job. And they're not, they're not always training them on what it takes to manage and develop people. But if you know how to do that, you know, I, I, I come up in training and development and honestly, a lot of my people management skills, came from working fast food. You manage people who are hourly, who hate their job, and you can get them motivated. You manage anybody. And um, to me, knowing that traditional of, no, I can train you on the skills that I need to train you on, and I expect that as part of my job, 
where I see a lot of managers think they're managing vendors versus employees. And it's a very different thing. This is such a great concept, a great topic to talk about. But I want to make sure that we cover a couple of these other ideas. One of them being, how do we know if our career is off track? Are there warning signs that we should be looking for if our career is off track? Uh, you know, I think everybody's a little bit different. A common one that I see in myself, as well as the people that I've coached, is that you start to um, really feel frustrated with things that used to not frustrate you, things that used to just feel like that's that's the battle cry. That's when I, you know, get passionate and I go in there and I, I, I make things happen. Or things that never used to bug me, now everything bugs me. It's easy to to all of a sudden go, God, I used to love this job, now everybody sucks, and not self-reflect and go, maybe I suck, maybe I'm tired, maybe I'm burned out, and I'm not willing to face the fact that I'm being called to do something else and take a different risk. So instead, I'm just going to commiserate about how horrible everybody else is, and, and they're making my life difficult. The new manager, the new process. The reality is, is when you love what you do, how other people show up has very little to do with your level of enjoyment. In fact, when I, when, when I see people in what I call in the flow of doing what they love, the people who are challenging and difficult, that's usually the ones who they're excited to work with because they're like, oh, we get to convert them. I get to show them how much what I do is going to make their lives better. Um, and I saw that in myself. I was working internally at my last job, and I, I just found myself getting irritated in meetings over things that never used to bother me. And I finally had to go, no, I, I, I need to go back out to consulting, and it scares me, and it's risky. And so I'm avoiding doing it, and instead I'm focused all on the little picadillos of other people that I don't, I don't like. And the reality is it's because I'm not being honest with myself. I'm not taking charge of my career. And so the book is called Low Man on the Totem Pole, Stop Begging for a Promotion, Start Selling Your Genius. And the last question before we jump into our learning from leaders section I have for you is – Many uh, employees out there are trying to look good for the boss. We're trying to put on a good show or trying to, you know, put good face for our boss. But one thing that you talk about is this can actually undercut performance. And so our last thought is, why does this undercut our performance trying to look good for the boss? Uh, Because it's fear-based. When we're trying to look good for, first of all, our bosses are not always the smartest people in the room on certain things. You've got to respect their role and the fact that they're in, you know, in charge of making certain decisions. Uh, but I, I believe my job exists because they're not supposed to know this stuff, whatever it is that I do. Uh, so, but if I'm afraid and I'm so busy trying to look good for them, I, I won't push back when it's the right time to push back. I won't ask questions and I'll be so consumed about whether or not I have the right reputation. I won't be focused creatively on the work that needs to get done. I won't partner with people. I won't share the space as much. Um, the workplaces have really set people up to compete against each other versus collaborate with one another because there's this not enough praise to go around, not enough promotion to go around. They keep talking about how organizations are flat and there's not as much room to, to move up. So that actually just strikes fear in people versus, look, you can invent the job that's needed a year from now. This is a whole new playing field. You can absolutely create demand for anything you want to do. doesn't mean it's easy, but that's business that's supply and demand in 101. So you can do all that. There's, a, there's almost like this wide range of opportunity. And if you start to, what I like to say is treat your boss like your number one customer versus your boss, because you'll, your brain will get out in front and be thinking much more strategically than the good employee who's trying to win brownie points. I love this idea. And one thing we talk about a lot is proactive versus reactive. And what I hear you saying is, you know, a good employee is out there being proactive, looking for opportunities to grow, looking where they want to be in the next year and how they can create that position. Whereas the competition, our colleagues, those working around us are more reactive. They're just doing what they're told to do. And then when things change, they're reacting to the change. Now, Heather, this is a great conversation and a great book, and we want to dive more into it. But of course, our time is limited. So I want to switch gears a little bit, talk to you about my favorite section, learning from leaders, where we add a little personal to this business conversation we've been having. How does that sound? Yeah, that's great. Perfect. All right. Our first question then is the book currently on your Kindle or bedside table. What are you reading these days? Um, God, I'm, I'm, I'm reading quite a few, but um, I would say uh, number one one is um, Ray Dalio and it's uh, Principles of Success. And uh, his is more from a financial standpoint, but I, I feel like it applies to business all over the place. And he's been 
doing this for so long and he's definitely revered as one of the best in the business. And I just, I, his book's very simple and kind of, you could almost hear the old school kind of advice, but very relevant for any, any, anybody at any point in time in their career or business. And such a great book. It's withstood the test of time in that it's a book that keeps coming up, being recommended. And so what a great book. How about your leadership superpower? Um, I, I like to call it compassionate reality checker. Um, I'm very big on, um, putting the mirror up and making sure that people are looking at what the reality is, because that's where I feel like people's stress comes from is not embracing reality as it is. But I, I have compassion for deep level of compassion for the level of stress and fear that, that the workplace can bring up. And so it's never, I'm never flipping about that, but I, I won't, I won't cover the mirror up. It's going to be there. How about a motivational quote, philosophy, or mantra, something that you live by? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, there's a few, but the, I think the magic one that goes a million miles is seek first to understand before trying to be understood. It, you know, the more, if, if, you know, if we dropped our fear, we'd want to understand the other person a little bit more before we shoved our opinions and viewpoints at them. Yeah, and it's such a great idea. You know, Stephen Covey sold over 25 million copies of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and there's a reason why seeking first to understand, then to be understood, is such a uh, timeless principle that he writes about and that still today is so vitally important. What a great philosophy to live by. Our final question then is the book that you gift most often to your friends, family, or colleagues, those people that you share with. You know, oddly enough, it's um, the uh, way of the superior man. And um, I read it because I was dating losers and I wanted to know what a superior man uh, was. And actually, as I started to read it, it's really it should be titled the way of the superior human. Um, But it's 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 an excellent um, it's an excellent kind of look at how do you live your life in a brave way and a kind of, you know, honest and authentic to who you are. It's by David Data, D-E-I-D-A. What a great recommendation. I have not read this, but it's something that's going on my bookshelf because it sounds like something that I would love to dive into and learn about how to become a superior human being. Uh, Wonderful. Heather, thank you so much for spending time with us. Before we let you go, how can we learn more about you and how can we pick up a copy of this great book? Uh, Yeah, you could... Get a copy of the book on Amazon. Uh, I've got it in Kindle as well as um, soft copy and then uh, our soft cover. And then also come to our website at lowmanonthetotempole.com. You'll see there that we've got a newsletter that you can sign up for. And we've also on Blog Talk Radio under Low Man on the Totem Pole have a podcast that we do biweekly that gives out free tips on on career. And we take questions. So uh, open for anybody's feedback. And, you know, with the way people are transitioning jobs and careers this day and age, it's so important to keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on when it comes to questions about interviewing or resumes or job searching. All of these are so important. And so I will link all of this up on the show notes for this page. Uh, Sure, appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Heather, for being this week's guest expert. Thank you so much for having me. This has been fantastic. Thank you. All right, my friends, what did you think of that? So good to have Heather with us and have a conversation about hiring, being hired, and what to look for in this changing career environment. You know, it's something that I've thought a lot about. I mentioned during the show that I gave a four-month notice to my last company that I worked for. And I went through a period where I was looking for work. I mean, I was, I was actively seeking, going on LinkedIn and looking for opportunities. And so a lot of these tips, these hacks, these tricks, these things that we talked about really resonated with me because they're things that I experienced as I was going through that period of my life. Of course, everything that we talked about on this episode of the podcast can be found on the show notes, jakeacarlson.com slash ml92. And that's where you can get the books and the quotes and everything that we talked about. Until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days and even better life. And of course, stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Bye.